recording for us. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. So it's my great pleasure to um, introduce our today's speaker, Greg Yang. From, he's a senior scientist at Microsoft Research, and he's going to talk about uh, zero shot hypertransfer transfer optimization for large scale transformer models. And it's uh, actually based on a series of paper, which I think sparked a lot of interest in both the theoretical community, but also in the, in the automatic community. And um, yeah, I'm really great to have you here today. And the floor is yours. Take it from here. Yeah, great. Thanks, Aaron and everyone for the invitation. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about this work today, which is based on uh, the TensorFlow and series of papers. And uh, this particular work is uh, the first major uh, empirical practical payoff from all the pretty hardcore theory that was done in the previous papers. And uh, this is a collaboration between uh, folks from Microsoft and OpenAI. So let's get started. Um, as a uh, research scientist or engineer, uh, you typically need to explore new ideas on a frequent basis. And uh, of course, you should start small when you explore new ideas. So you explore with some small model. And uh, if you get lucky, uh, the idea works uh, on this uh, small model. And you get a nice training curve like this. And then the natural next step is to scale up. And uh, you just naively scale up. And probably not too infrequently, uh, your model actually fails to train or it has some problem, uh, like this uh, orange curve here. So at this point, there's uh, some uncertainty with regard to whether your idea just sucks uh, at large scale, or is it because I need to retune my hyperparameters? Uh, you know, because deep learning, as is well known, is kind of sensitive to hyperparameters, and uh, and, and there's you know this whole uh, literature on hyperparameter optimization. Uh, so at this point, if your if your problem setting is small, then you know tuning these hyperparameters. You know, it's no biggie. Just do it. Uh, so, so this uncertainty is really not not much of a bottleneck. But when your problem is actually quite large, uh, like say on GPT scale, where like you you know every training run takes a couple million dollars, uh, this is something you really can't afford to do. Um, so, so this uncertainty lingers, and you can't actually tell whether uh, you know some modification you you made or some new ideas you have are actually good ideas on large settings or not. So an example of what this work allows you to do is to set those hyperparameters automatically, optimally, if that is really the issue at hand, right? So you would be able to get this kind of, uh, for example, this kind of nice training curve on the right uh, for the large model, uh, if, if that is uh, really the issue. So underlying this uh, is uh, the maximum other parameterization, abbreviated MUP. Uh, and in short, it's just a principal way of scaling initialization learning rate with the width of the model. Uh, it's backed by beautiful mathematics that I'll come to talk about a bit later. But here's a short, uh, small table that encapsulates what MUP is about. Um, so the, the takeaway right now is that it, it's just a small table that tells you how to set the initialization and uh, the learning of fresh ED and Atom for different uh, weights, input weights, output weights, hidden weights of the network. And the entries tell you how to do the scaling, but don't worry about the entries right now. The point I, I wanna just make right now is just that the form of the table is really quite simple. Uh, and uh, just this simple form of uh, scaling rules will, would give you the right way of um, uh, the, or, or the, the phenomenon you saw earlier where you said the hard parameters correctly for large models. But we'll come back to this table in detail later. But for now, if you just take this table and run with it, uh, you discover that MP has a key property called the hyperparameter stability. So uh, first, as a negative example of uh, hyperparameter stability, uh, we can look at the standard parameterization. So the default kind of parameterization in PyTorch uh, or TensorFlow. And um, if you do uh, the following experiment where you sweep a hyperparameter like learning array or initialization on the x-axis, and plot the training performance on the y-axis, uh, then you typically you discover that there's you know some unique uh, like hyperparameter that maximizes uh, performance. Uh, so that looks normal. But if you keep doing this for larger and larger models, 
you observe a couple of different things. So one is that the optimal hyperparameter will shift uh, as you increase the size of the model. Second is that the curves will uh, uh, intersect, uh, which means that like if you fix hyperparameter increase width at some point, you're gonna actually decrease performance. Now, as a positive example of hyperparameter stability, we have uh, mu p. So if you redo the same experiments, but just scaling up using mu p, you'll see that like the hyperparameters, optimal hyperparameters are stable and uh, the, the curves are not intersecting, uh, which means that you know, uh, when you increase the width of the model, you always do better. So this is a cartoon, but uh, in reality, things are quite similar. So uh, with transformer OHDEX2 trained by Adam, on the left, we're now plotting training and loss on the y-axis and learning rate on the x-axis. And uh, as you can see, like uh, larger models have prefer um, uh, smaller learning rates. Uh, so that, that's reflected by the curves shifting to the left as the darker gets, uh, sorry, as the color gets darker. Um, and uh, the curves are all intersecting everywhere, right? So if you take the best learning rate, for the smallest model right here, and then you try to use it on the largest model, which is the dark, the dark color here, then you know, you're gonna have a very bad time. And uh, this could be an explanation for this underlying plot that uh, we saw uh, earlier. Uh, right, and then on the right, we have mu p, uh, and uh, in contrast to the figure on the left, you, know, you see all the things, all the curves, uh, you know, fit together very nicely. The optimal learning rate is stable, and uh, you know, like the the curves are not intersecting. So you always gain something when you increase with the model. So here, uh, I'm just talking about learning rate, but uh, in general, you can actually do a lot more hyperparameters, not just learning rate. Uh, so so here are some plots. So learning rate. Uh, then here's a cross entropy temperature, which is like a multiplier on the output of the network. Uh, here's initialization standard deviation. Uh, here we picked four, uh, sorry, six uh, representative learning rate schedules, like you know, inverse square root decay, linear decay, like step drops of learning rate, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, what you want to watch for in these plots is just that uh, for the numerical continuous hyperparameters. Uh, the optimal hyperparameters are stable as you increase with the width model. And then for the learning schedule, you just want to watch that the uh, ordering between the, the six learning schedules are consistent as you increase uh, the width of the model, right? So the best remains the best and the worst remains the worst. Um, so uh, for, for visual simplicity here, we just kind of fixed other hyperparameters and swept a single hyperparameter. But uh, the, the theory of mu p actually kind of guarantees in a sense that you can sweep any combination uh, of these things and the, the optimal combination will be transferred where like a stable uh, across the width of the model. Uh, and you can, you know, so here are, we represent, we're presenting these uh, hyperparameters as kind of global hyperparameters for the entire network, but you can also uh, separate them out per layer, per weight tensor. And that is also something that is kind of guaranteed in a sense and we actually leverage uh, later on in the uh, large model training. But in any case, uh, so far, uh, most of our focus has been on width of the model like what happens when you scale the width of the model. And of course, the natural question to ask is if you can do width, can you do depth? Uh, can you do bad size you know, and other scaling dimensions, for example? Um, and uh, so, so that's a very natural question. And so we just thought to uh, answer it in the most naive way possible to establish a good baseline. And uh, so the, the good news is that on something like pre-layering transformer, the, uh, if you just naively uh, increase depth, uh, you do, so we're literally just increasing depth without compensating for the large depth by anything. So like, so for example, uh, we're not scaling the initialization of learning rate with depth or something. It just, so it's just a completely naive method. Um, and uh, with the same four hyperparameters, you can see that like you get a reasonable amount of uh, 
stability in the optimal hyperparameters when you increase depth um, uh, between, in the range of two to 32. Uh, so, so the lesson here is that just that empirically, we're observing that over a reasonable range of depth, the hyperparameters are reasonably stable and probably can be used in practice for something like pre layering or transformer. Um, but it also uh, doesn't work in several situations like post layering transformers uh, and so on and so forth. So it's just a very much an empirical finding. Uh, we also done the same thing with batch size sequence length training time. And again, the message here is that over reasonable ranges of these uh, like scaling dimensions, uh, the optimal hyperparameters are reasonably stable, okay? And, but we're not saying this is the best way to do it. Uh, we're just saying this is like, the naive way is reasonably stable in these dimensions that's, that can, can be empirically used in a certain way. And, uh, but, but this is like in direct contrast with the, the case with width, where if you do the naive thing, you're just gonna get a really bad result. Okay, so coming back to width uh, for a little bit, um, I also want to mention this uh, pretty interesting property, which is that uh, wider networks are, are better throughout training in MUP. So for example, if you look at the, this plot here, I'm plotting the training curves now. So I'm plotting against training step on the x-axis. And now uh, the different, uh, what you want to observe is that the different curves uh, don't intersect and like the, the darker curves always lie beneath the lighter curves. Right. And, you know, this, like, if you just look at this, it sounds almost something like we should take for granted. Like, I mean, sh should it not be the case that, you know, wider is always better during training? Like, this seems natural, right? Uh, but probably, like, if you have any, ex any experience with actually training your networks, you know that, like, that's typically not the case with standard parameterization. So here's an example. Uh, with a small learning rate uh, in standard parameterization, you can uh see like you can see an illusion of this thing happening for small enough uh width up to like 2000 around here uh and then when you go larger you just do a lot worse all of a sudden right and uh as an engineer you might think okay there's probably something wrong with my implementation some uh some precision issue uh but no it's just a mathematical issue and if you just use a large learning rate uh, for a uh, standard parameterization, you can actually see that the uh, network just blows up uh, immediately uh, and like kind of uh, uh, wider is actually worse, right? Okay, so again, the summary here is just that you, you should expect that wider is better, uh, at least like measuring against training loss, like that should be the case uh, throughout training. And we should, we should take that for granted, but we can't actually currently. So MEP gives you that property. So based on all of the above finding, we propose a pretty simple way to tune uh, large new networks called mu transfer. So it's a zero shot hyperparameter transfer technology, which means that uh, you don't need to tune the, the, you don't need to touch the large new network until the very end when you actually want to train it. So what this does is just, uh, you shrink the network uh, in UP, uh, tune the small neural network, and then just copy the tune hyperparameters back to the large neural network, right? And this this only works if you're in UP. I mean, otherwise, you know, as you can already see from the plots earlier, this does not does not work. Uh, so everything I've said so far, we carefully validated a model's an interesting scale from uh, MLP on CFAR10 all the way to GPT-3 and over you know, language and uh, vision tasks. So uh, we're fairly confident that you know, uh, all the things uh, I've said are fairly robust phenomena. To summarize, uh, why do we like MEP? Well, one, it preserves the hyperparameter optimum cross the model scale. This is theoretically guaranteed for width in a sense. Uh, and empirically, 128 to 256 gives good estimate of the optimal hyperparameter at low compute cost. Um, and empirically, we also verify this for depth and other stuff over reasonable ranges. Uh, but again, we're not saying that's the end of the story for these uh, scaling dimensions. We're just saying like the, the most naive thing you do looks reasonable, but it probably can be improved. 
Uh, second, um, uh, MIPS is a property that wider is better, uh, which again is something you want to take for granted, but currently you cannot. Uh, and altogether, this allows uh, the zero shot hyperparameter transfer technology, uh, which at the current point is the only method for tuning large neural networks. And it is very, very efficient in both space and time in space because, uh, you know, like your, your large neural network might not fit on hardware, you know, a thousand GPUs, but you can, you can shrink it so that it fits on a single GPU and it's tuning very, very fast and in a, par a very uh, highly uh, parallelizable fashion, right? Can I ask one question briefly? Sure. Um, yes. So um, I understand this correctly. So if you change the width, then you need to scale the parameters. Um, but if you change the depth or the batch size, then you don't need to scale them. Or I don't. Yeah. So 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 that's that's uh, right. Uh, so you know what we're talking about here, like uh, the the really the, the the smart thing we're doing is just scaling with width. And like, if you don't, if you aren't smart about this, then it just doesn't work. Like it just does very poorly. Uh, but we empirically verified, so this is a, the most naive thing. Uh, we empirically verified that uh, the naive thing works for depth and batch size, all these, these other things over reasonable ranges. So when we when we do experiments later on, for example, on BERT, we, we shrink width and depth, you know, and uh, training time and so on and so forth. Uh, and then tune that small model and then transfer it to the large model. But the, the, the width part is kind of like the smart thing. And then the other stuff are kind of the dumb thing that we just empirically investigated and found that you worked reasonably well. And then we just did that. I see, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Right, and altogether this enables uh, more reliable scaling up of new networks. Okay, so the plan next is to, uh, I'll actually tell you about what is MUP because uh, remember that table at the beginning, so I haven't given you the details yet. And then I'll show you some actual uh, empirical experience on large models. And then I'll talk about some of the theoretical foundation and then I'll conclude. Uh, but let me pause here. If you have any question about this brief, brief overview we had on MU transfer and MUP so far. Um, I just had a quick question about the, the mu p. So, do you observe in practice that you lose any extra expressive expressivity as compared to the standard parameterization? No. Um, like okay. mathematically, they're kind of equivalent for any fixed step. Oh, sorry, fi fixed width. Like it's just a rescaling, right? So, so like if you fix the width, like there's no difference between mu p and standard parameterization. Okay. It's only when you scale up that they're different. And uh, well, actually in some sense, like uh, as I talked about in the theoretical foundation part, uh, as you scale up the width to infinity, like uh, the expressivity for um, mu p is actually strictly greater than in sp. Okay, thanks. All right, so let me uh, move on. So to give you some intuition about mu p, it helps to start with the simple example. So let's let's start with the three-layer MLP. Uh, so FSI is the output network on input xi, and uh, you have three uh, weight matrices w1, w2, w3. And uh, in standard parameterization, you're going to initialize the uh, weights as follows. So w1 will be sampled from some distribution with zero mean and variance one over d in, or d in is a data dimension or the input dimension. And then w2 and three have variance one over n, where n is the width of the model. Uh, and then uh, let's initialize bias to zero and uh, denote the learning rate as eta. So at this point, uh, this, this should look familiar. And if you uh, just you know, do the one, any one of those experiments that uh, we saw earlier where you sweep the width and the uh, learning rate, you know, so on and so forth, you get this kind of plot where the curves are shifting to the left. Uh, so the, the, the optimal learning rate for the larger models are getting smaller and, you know, they're all intersecting everywhere. It looks really bad, right? So if you use this best learning rate for the smallest model on the largest model, you're going to have a very bad time. 
Now let's see how uh, mu ptrust fixes. Um, so he makes three modifications uh, highlighted in purple. So the first one is the downscaling of the initialization of the output layer weights, W3. Uh, so th this one from one over n to one over n squared. Uh, and then the second one is the downscaling of the learning rate for the last layer. So now it's downscaled by a factor of n, where n is a width. And then finally, the input layer weights and the biases learning rate are upscaled by a factor of n. So at this point, probably this looks pretty puzzling. Like there doesn't seem to be any apparent pattern here. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about intuition in a second, but if you just you know go with this uh, and repeat experiments on the left, you're gonna get this nice looking set of plots, right? Where the uh, performance, uh, sorry, the optimal learning rate is stable uh, and uh, the curves are not crossing, right? Like you, you get a, like a really nice looking pattern here where like uh, this indicates that the, uh, as you increase the width of the model, you always gain something, right? Even if you aren't at the optimal point. Okay, now let's look at uh, these uh, modifications and see uh, why we're making these. So you, it helps to first write out the output of the function uh, as a sum. So the, the output of the function is the dot product, first of all, right, between W3 and this embedding. So I'm just gonna write out the dot product is sum. So the sum has n elements uh, and e each element of sum uh, is an entry of the uh, output layer ways times the entry of the embedding, right? And uh, one thing you can notice, uh, this will might take you a little bit time to calculate, but uh, if you skip all the calculation, what you can conclude is that like this embed, every entry embedding has typical size theta one. Um, what I mean by that is that as width becomes large, uh, the typical size of uh, these entries will not explode to infinity and will not vanish to zero. Okay. Um, so again, like, you know, you, if you can do this calculation and you can make it simpler by assuming phi is hyperbolic tangent or something, um, and that will make it rather apparent. But uh, if you accept this, then these two modifications ensures that uh, every entry of W3 uh, has typical size one over N as with N becomes large. So like, we, can, we can look at this uh, actually, and we can derive this very simply. So for example, initialization, this is the case, it's one over N squared uh, variance. So standard deviation one over N, so it's one over N scaled initialization. And then uh, during training, the learning rate is one over N scaled. And the, the gradient of W3 is the learning rate, sorry, uh, the update to W3 is the is gradient times the learning rate and the gradient is like the, the this, this phi times the loss derivative at the output. Uh, so, so the gradient to W3 is beta one scaled entry wise. So multiplied by the learning rate is uh, N inverse scaled, right? So, so these two things ensure that W3, every entry W3 has scale one over n as n becomes large. Okay, so why does this matter? Well, you're summing up n things and now each thing has size one over n. So uh, right now you can guarantee that you cannot blow up, right? Because summing up n things each of one over n, like this, the size is at most uh, one. Uh, we're on the, on the scale of one as you increase uh, the width of the model. You could, uh, decay to zero though, because there could be possibly uh, cancellation uh, when you make the sum. So in particular, when you actually are in translation, then there is some cancellation here because like, you know, every entry W3 is independent from other entries uh, and independent from uh, phi, uh, da, da, da here. Um, but the key insight here is that as you start training, W3 and the embedding are gonna become correlated so that like this actually prevents any significant cancellation from happening uh, uh, along the, this, uh, this sum. So that the conclusion here is actually uh, f of xi is gonna be theta one size uh, uh, throughout training. So again, like that means that the, the size of the output uh, at any time step will not explode or vanish to zero 
uh, as a width goes to infinity. Okay. So like this almost seems like a trivial property, you know, like, sure. Uh, but it's a necessary property because, you know, like the, uh, for one, like the, 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 the floating form format that you use, especially in large models have a limited range, right? And you really don't want to like, like you don't really don't want your output scale to actually depend on the model size. You want it to be within that floating point range. Uh, but secondly, like just mathematically, uh, the uh, loss function has an effective range. Uh, this is, you know, like a pretty apparent in the square loss, for example, where like, you really don't want to be like way, way out in the like toward infinity when you're when you have square loss because then the gradient will blow up, right? Um, so for many reasons, like this is at least a necessary property to have good training dynamics. Um, and again, like it's something we should take for granted, but we can't in the current way that things are done. Like if you redo the calculation, then then FSI actually blows up with the, with the model. So this is actually pretty bad. Okay, so uh, so this is just a very simple example to show you why we're making some of these modifications we're making. But these kind of problems occur like throughout the network with the standard pressurization, and we're with these kind of uh, uh, modifications, we're fixing all of them at once. Okay, any questions so far about this? All right, then let me move on. So uh, this is the table that you saw at the beginning for from UP. And uh, again, the, the rows are the different hyperparameters that we're scaling. So initialization variance or learning of HD or Atom. And the columns are the you know, input weights biases, upper weights, hidden weights. And the, the entries the table tells you how to scale these hyperparameters for different, these different primary tensors in the network. So the way you read the entries is that the black plus purple ones give you a new P the black plus gray ones give you SP. Um, so in particular, the changes are happening where there's color. Uh, so in particular, if you look at the first two rows that give that recapitulates what you saw with example earlier, and uh, and for instance, uh, the, the output weight scaling for uh, neutralization variance is one of the squared, like before, and learning rate is one of the like before, right? Of course, when we talk about large scale pre-training on neural networks, we're typically talking about Atom uh, and training on transformers. Uh, so we need to figure out the right scaling for Atom learning rate. And it turns out the right thing to do is one over fan in uh, for both the uh, outweight, upper weights and hidden weights. So I wanna stress here that I'm not saying that you should use exactly learning one over fan in, I'm saying that you should scale your learning rate like so. So like when you have some learning rate and you double the, the fan in, you should half the uh, learning rate for that larger model, right? So this is kind of a bit different from the usual way people think about initialization or parameterization. They think about some prescription of like, you know, I, I, at, at, with 1024, I'm gonna use exactly one unique degree and that's the right thing to do. You know, that, that's probably not necessarily the exactly right thing to do, um, but uh, but the, the, the scaling rules here are kind of weaker prescriptions, but they're more robust as a result. Uh, in addition, for transformers, like there's another modifications you have to do. So uh, you should use a one over D instead of one over square D tension, which means that the tension logic should be calculated as K times K times query divided by D instead of K times query divided by square D, where there, there could be tunable constants here. But uh, the point here is, Again, like in the example, the key and queries get correlated over the course of training. So like K, K times Q actually scales like D instead of square root of D. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about instruments, but any, does anybody have a brief uh, questions before that? Yeah, maybe a, a quick one. So um, yeah. are there are there constants in front of these that I all need to tune, right? I mean, are they like nine? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so like they're all potential uh, tunable constants in front of these. Uh, every, every time there's a fan in or like E and, and like there's a potential constants you can tune. Uh, so in practice, uh, as we'll talk about in the experience, 
we just we uh so probably you should tune everything like because uh you know you can just do random search and like the, the not important dimensions will just not factor into the random search but like uh in practice what we tune uh for the most part is like the global initialization the essentially like the learning rate for the hidden layers for the output layers and for the hidden layers and like a like a multiplier on the attention like so yeah like a like a like a constant in front of the one already here like yeah and then it's like so other stuff depends on the situation like maybe also or almost uh also a bias multiplier which is essentially uh equivalent to like a bias learning rate mm -hmm. and, and so this, that's a sample go ahead so is, is this something that uh, is easy to understand or you need to figure this out for every new model um having a deep yeah insight? it's it's uh i would say it's pretty easy to understand so like um yeah i don't actually have slides on this but like roughly you should think about your network uh parameters like 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 so so like if you if it, if uh so think of a hidden the hidden dimension as something that's going to infinity Okay, but like the input dimension and output dimension would be like the sequence length and so on and so forth are fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then you look at your primary tensors. So like the input weights uh, have like kind of dimension that's like, you know, like something fixed and then something going to infinity. Output weights is kind of the opposite, but it's, it's like it's essentially only one dimension is going to infinity. And then hidden weights is like infinity by infinity. So like roughly speaking, if you just categorize your parameters like like so, uh, then like these rule would just apply. Um, yeah, so so like so uh, actually like you, we have a GitHub package for this, and the way we're implemented actually uses a slightly different table that makes this distinction actually a bit easier to tell. Uh, so like in that in that particular. Way we're doing things we actually kind of unify the input weights biases and upper weights as kind of like what we call vector like parameters which are like parameters that have only one dimension going infinity and then the other dimensions are kind of like constant dimensions so like in general you have this i guess you can say like you have like scalar like parameters and vector like parameters and then matrix like parameters which are essentially just are classified based on how many dimensions of that tensor is going to infinity uh and uh, and then there's like kind of a, a table you can just like look up like this uh, for how do how do you scale different things? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I mean maybe we can uh, can. I, I was just referring to which which of these pre uh, tunable constants you you put in here, right? I mean wh whether that that needs some intuition, what. Um, yeah, like I seen, I seen like in practice, like which uh, hover parameters should matter the most. Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, like from our understanding, which maybe is not like you know perfect, uh, but might may, may may get better as time goes on. But our intuition is that um, uh, initialization, like learning rate, like. At least, like learning rate for input layer, output layer, and the hidden layers, like you should you should try to divide those up, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, I mean potentially initialization you can also divide up per layer, but we didn't actually try that. We just always swept um, a, a thick uh, global initialization scaling. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the most important. And then like, we also tried a bunch of things just because it's, we just did random search for scientific purposes. So we just threw everything in there uh, because I guess I for scientific reasons, we actually want to show that when you throw everything there, you can transfer that this large combination because that's like a specific power of EP that you can transfer uh, really large combinations of hot parameters. Um, uh, yeah, but, but like, I think from our understanding, our rough understanding so far that's the case that um like the things i've said so far are probably among them the more important other parameters okay thanks mm -hmm. okay so let's talk about the some empirical results so we have a lot of experiments in the paper but of course i can't actually talk about all of them here so i'll just show you three sets of um experiments 
that gives you a good sense of what, what's happening here. Um, so on the smaller side of things, we uh, we're do, we're do some experiment on IWSLT, which involves transferring from a 4 million parameter model to 40 million parameter model. And because it's smaller, we can actually do a bit more science and map out the performance compute creator frontier as shown here, where like the conventional is the orange and then the blue is ours. Uh, and the x-axis is compute and the y-axis is uh, blue score. And uh, in the setting, like, as you can see, like the for the same quality model, like mu p is about one, uh, like 10 times better in, in terms of compute. Uh, but actually like the, this is, uh, the better news is actually that like, because we're tricking ourselves to the small setting to do the science, the, the efficiency gain is limited. Uh, artificially, uh, and uh, as the target model gets larger and larger, the efficiency gain actually goes up proportional to model size. Uh, and that's just because like with mu transfer, you, it's, it's not like you have to, you know, there's a, you have to tune on a 10, 10 times smaller model and no smaller, or the like the, the, the proxy model size on which you tune, can remain like roughly constant as you increase the target model size and the tuning will still be like relatively accurate. Um, so the efficiency gap actually goes up uh, directly with the model size. And uh, we'll see that uh, as we talk about BERT and GPT. So with BERT, um, we are uh, tuning a 10 million parameter model and transferring to 130 million uh, parameter models, which correspond to per base and per large. So you can notice here that we're tuning once uh, and then use it, use the same set of hyperparameters for the whole family of models. So both per base and per large. Uh, and here we're leveraging uh, transfer across width, depth and training path. Right, and again, like width is kind of this theoretically principal thing. And then the other things are empirical findings. So we, we find reasonable empirical. So the total tuning cost on the 10 million parameter model is equivalent to one for training run of per large. Uh, and uh, so just, you know, you can appreciate that this is already quite like great because uh, it's pretty hard to ask for uh, good hyperparameters if you just try a single random combination of hyperparameters, right? And this is kind of equivalent to that in the total training, uh, sorry, the tune, total tuning cost. And uh, as a result, we beat uh, Megatron BERT, which is kind of like the best uh, hand-tuned BERT we have on the market uh, for, for, from like before the mu p time period. Um, and uh, so here I'm showing like improvement over the baseline uh, for BERT base and BERT large. So, so all of these are positive improvements. Um, and uh, but you can also notice in this plot something more interesting, which is that mu transfer actually improves per large more than per base, right? So if you think about it, this is actually opposite of the typical intuition you have about, you know, uh, how some method can improve a lot or better model versus worse models. So typically, right, like you expect that, you know, if you have some new method, uh, you will improve the smaller model or like the, the worst model more than the better model because you know, like it's much harder to add 1% to 99% than 1% to 50% accuracy, right? But, uh, but here we actually have the opposite where like per large, the larger model actually improved more than the smaller one. And if you think about it, this just says that like people are just really bad at guessing hyperparameters before mu p. Like, uh, I mean, of course, the way people guess was just extrapolating from the small model that they actually have uh, more experience on. And this extrapolation is just bad for like larger and larger models. And uh, this, this, so this is just a reflecting that we are taking that low hanging fruit, like that, that gap between the back guesses and the actual optimal. And we'll see this trend continue with uh, GPT, that like on larger I models, we actually do better. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, just because I think it's the right time. So, so can can you be a bit more specific here? So you are, I mean, there's all sorts of parameters except for learning rate. Like there's a warm up ratio. There's like you say training time. There's Adam parameters. 
So yeah. do you do you all tune them on the smaller model and then um, you know f fix them and just scale up the depth, the training time? And how, I mean, how do you do that? Yeah. The width uh, comes from your theory, but for the depth yeah. and training time, it's it's you just scale it up and and don't change the parameters. So. Right. So. Uh... Yeah, so so essentially we the the dispersed small, what is called dispersed small. So like mm -hmm. we obtain that by just shrinking uh like the bird family to uh I think width 236 uh depth four, if I remember correctly. And uh doing during tuning, we also shrink the training time to be 10 times less. Right. So like I think uh yeah, so like from uh, uh, one million steps of training to uh, 100,000 steps of training. And uh, so, yeah, so, and then we tune for 256 uh, random combinations of hyperparameters. So that includes uh, kind of the, the things I've said, I, I talked about uh, like the initialization, effectively like learning for the hidden layers and the last layer and the input layer, uh, learning for the bias. Um, and, uh, uh, there's like also like the attention multiplier. Um, yeah, might be other ones I'm forgetting. Like it's this like we have a big table in the paper describing this. Yeah, but, um, but, yeah. Okay, but if I compare it to what people normally do, I mean, obviously they don't scale widths. You you yep. basically tune the learning rate, right? I mean, you're not touching the other things like um, atom parameters, dropout fraction, or, or I don't know warm up ratio or anything. You you no. just okay. No. And you're kind of tuning, you you kind of bring additional parameters into the game that the other people wouldn't even look at because they fixed the, but you need to do that in order to guarantee the the, the proper scaling with, with the width, right? Okay. I mean, no, you don't have to tune them. Like uh, we're just tuning them because we can, like, why not? I see, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can you can tune on global learning if you, if you want, like you probably are leaving money on the table, but you can. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, there's no reason for us to, to only do that in our case. So we just kind of, you know, just did, uh, go all out and uh, yeah. I see. But you, but you could also, so there's also nothing holding you back from optimizing um, momentum, for example, or, you know, yeah. warm-up ratio. It's just- Yeah, uh, and it's yeah, just yeah, yeah, the, yeah, nothing, the, yeah. The same That's pattern right. should also be for those hyperparameters, like, okay. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, uh, I think momentum. We tried momentum on CFR or something. It didn't really have, make a difference, uh, yeah. so we didn't actually do that. Right. But but yeah, uh, uh, actually, we did do some scientific uh, experiment on like atom beta one and beta two on smaller transformers. And again, it doesn't really make a huge difference mm -hmm. for transformers, so we didn't. We just left it. I see. And yeah. <clears throat> just just to that I understand this correctly, so if you do this hyperparameter optimization. Um, the training itself stays the same, right? You just optimize your um, your unsupervised training loss here, and it just take this the, you take the hyperparameter completion of the sheets, just the smallest training loss on this bird small, and those hyperparameters are then uh, used to train the full model, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and you yeah, just look at the training loss. So, how do you how do you select? Yeah, I mean here. Control? So, yeah, for these settings, like uh, large scale pre training, like you don't actually typically have overfitting issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's the same, like training loss, validation, they're essentially being optimized by the same hub parameters. I see. And the training time, I guess the, the smaller model converges much, much faster than the larger model, I, I suppose. So that's, uh, that's yeah, potentially, yeah. I don't think we actually, look, I mean, I think that's, that would be the right guess here, uh, that we didn't actually look at that particular phenomenon, but okay. But I, th I think that's a reasonable thing to say. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So your so your advice, sorry, a very last one. Your advice is sure. not just to scale the width to make the age, uh, the the model smaller, but also the depth and the training time and um, uh, you know, in in some more heuristic way. Yeah. So so uh, uh, okay. So so let me say this. So like we're really really confident that width works really well. Like this is something that you should uh, always do. Uh, for depth and training time, these are like heuristics on specific model architectures that we find that's useful. You might not be robust to you know other settings. Like if you come up with some like speech model or something, 
right? Like it might not work. Or also like if you have something really deep, uh, then like that might also not work. Like again, like we're only confident like in in a like reasonable range, like you know, two to thirty-two. Like that's very large is like essentially thirty-two layers, I think. Um, so so like uh so does that make sense so like we're not that confident about these things but like uh on on per large like because like the model is not too deep and the training time is actually i think training time is kind of okay like as long as you like don't train for too short uh, on the small model i think like you get reasonable uh accurate estimate for the whole training run but but depth is something that like is reasonable over reasonable ranges but like not super deep uh, but again, like uh, there's like a dependence uh, of these, I think depth, especially uh, dependence of the transfer quality on the architecture. So like post layer neural transforming doesn't work. Uh, so again, like there's a lot of variance here that, you know, again, we're not claiming that it's the best thing to do, just that it's something that we were confident that we worked on BERT because of architecture and because of prior experience we did, but probably not for everything. But for width, it's really something that should work everywhere. Uh, it should be like the, the literal the default of PyTorch, and we're talking to them about this. And uh, like, it, does, it work. It will work regardless of your architecture, regardless of how long you train and other stuff. Right. So like, that's something that's like very robust. Mm. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so now let's talk about GPT. Uh, by the way, so I have maybe ten minutes left. Uh, it's like, are people Okay with going over, or should I stop sharp at ten, or I like, set my time ten? No, I think it's okay if you if you go over a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. So uh, now let's talk about GPT. So this is a this is a collaboration with OpenAI, and um, the the way the collaboration worked was uh, that we 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 never got to see their code, but we only were able to communicate up top like what are the mathematics behind this, like what are the experiments that we did and, and what are the tips and tricks to get things to work. Um, and then they, they implement everything themselves uh, in their own code base. Um, so as such, you can think of this as kind of like as independent second validation of uh, all of our techniques. Uh, and indeed they came out positive, like so you have the hyperparameter optimal and stable here, the usual plot, and then here you have wider is better. Uh, but but now you're going from 266 to 33k in width uh, on on a, like a shallower version of uh, GPT. Um, so everything looks great, and we we were relatively confident of the quality of implementation. Um, so we applied this to uh, GPT 3 uh, 6.7b. So we were transferring from a model 40 million parameters to the 6.7b model. So that's an increase of more than 150 times um, compared to bird, bird large was like increase of 30 times around. Um, so here the total tuning compute budget is only 7% of the training budget. Uh, just it's literally because like the small model is much smaller than the large model that like you can tune pretty aggressively. And uh, you, yeah, like the, the tuning budget is still 7% of the, of the training budget. Uh, and as the, the model gets larger and larger, like, you know, we didn't do this, but I suppose we did do this on the 175B model of GPT-3, then this is probably gonna be like 0.5% or something even less. Um, yeah, as, as the graphs show here, uh, we actually beat the original GPT-3 617B over a majority of the metrics. Uh, so, so we, the, the metrics here uh, involve like all of the original metrics from the original GPT-3 paper. Uh, here, we're just showing some you know, representative zero shot numbers, um, but uh, you can you know, look at the paper for the whole panel. And in fact, continuing the trend with the, the, the BERT case, uh, we see that the mean transfer 6.7B model actually is roughly on par with the original 13B model. So like, if you look at the panel of um, tasks, like the like, like roughly half of them, uh, like the six or seven B plus mean transfer does better, and half of them like thirteen B, thirteen B original model does better. Um, so again, like this continuous trend of like on larger models actually gain more from mean transfer, just because people were not great at guessing these hyperparameters. 
Okay, so that's all I'll say about the empirical side of mean transfer. And then uh, I guess, so I may, maybe I'll, I'll pause here. Like I can say a bit about the theoretical foundation where I can also just conclude if people you know, don't feel like hearing about this. Like, so how do people feel right now? Or we can just discuss, that's also fine. Um, I, for one, am keen to hear about the theoretical foundations. Okay, so yeah, plus one. All right, all right, great. Uh, then let's let's look at this. Um, so first of all, like uh, the the notion of parameterization, uh, uh, we kind of talked about this already. Is something that's maybe a bit different than what you are used to. Um, so you know, this is a table for um, UP. But in general, parameterization can be thought of as, as just a way of fitting sorry, this table uh, of how do you scale these different hyperparameters with uh, the size of the model. So in particular, it's something that can tell you half the learning rate when the width doubles, but it's it's not something that tells you use exactly learning rate when you negative three at width 1024, right? It's, it's, a, it's a measure of how to change things when the model size changes, but it doesn't tell you any, anything uh, at a particular model size. So as such for any fixed model size, you know, all the parameterizations are equivalent essentially. Um, and you can think of parameterizations as kind of the basis of uh, hyperparameters as the model size becomes large. So as such, because parameterization tells you like, you know, how do you change your hyperparameters as you go to uh, the, the infinite width, you know, limit, it, it, it actually corresponds to uh, a particular way to take a limit, right? It, because it's like, a, you know, it tells you uh, here's the direction to travel to infinity and as such, like uh, any parameterization specifies an infinite width limit and uh, conversely, any infinite width limit needs to define the limit by defining how you travel to infinity. So, so that's, uh, there's a bijection between parameterization and infinite width limits. So if you know about some, you know, theory, like, you know, the, the kernel limit, the NTK limit in your networks, I guess is induced by the NTK parameterization, which is specific parameterization that makes kind of the update small uh, when you uh, go to the infinite width limit. And uh, mu p is, again, you know, it's a particular parameterization that induces uh, the quote unquote D feature learning limit uh, of uh, infinite width in networks. So again, like this kind of uh, correspondence or bijection is uh, pretty natural and obvious uh, if you just look at the definitions. Um, but here I'm gonna present to you something uh, that's not obvious. So this is what I call the optimal scaling thesis. And it's essentially something, a uh, thesis that uh, relates uh, optimal, the optimal parameterization and the optimal limit. So what I mean by optimal parameterization, I mean, it has the two properties that we've seen with MEP so far. So one is uh, HP transfer, which means that it preserves the optimal hyperparameter across model sizes. The second is larger is better, which just means that you should never see a situation where like, you know, the uh, going larger actually does worse. Okay. So that's what I mean by optimal parameterization. But what I mean by optimal limit, well, it's is uh, uh, is this is a definition that probably doesn't make sense a lot to you right now. But at least right now, uh, this just says that it has the property of maximal update, or it maximizes feature learning without blowing up. Uh, so this probably is yeah, it's fuzzy at this point compared to the left left side. But uh, I'll I'll go to the example of width to give you some more understanding of this uh, property. But uh, as as uh, framed as such, the the optimal scaling thesis is a bridge between uh, what's empirically useful and what's like what's theoretically correct, or like what is the correct theory to actually think about, right? And uh, it is, I would say, probably one of the rare uh, you know hypotheses in, in deep learning, which kind of like directly gives you empirical benefits from any theoretical breakthroughs on the right. Because you can, you know, like, if you figure out the right limit, it gives you the right parameterization that you can directly ship into your model next day and benefit from that. And as I state uh, this thesis here, 
I actually were careful to avoid specializing to width. So like the, this is a thesis for any notion of model size really, uh, which is instantiated for width in, in this talk, for the bulk of this talk. Uh, and I'll show you more uh, about this later on, but it's also a thesis about uh, any other scaling dimension of training. So like depth or number experts, the MOE and so on and so forth. Um, so for the rest of the part, this part of the talk, let me just give you uh, uh, some more idea of uh, how this thesis is true for width. So in particular, right now I'm gonna show you uh, an, an animation that just shows you that mu p is a unique parameterization that has these two properties that you, know, you have HP transfer and larger spectra. Okay, so this is the animation. So what's happening here is on the right, I'm sweeping through uh, a, a 2D space of parameterizations, uh, which contain the, the standard parameterization of Pi default and mu p. And the, the two dimensions of this plane are essentially how you scale the initialization and how you scale the learning rate and it's the interpolation between uh, the, the PyTorch D4 and MUP. Okay, so it's a 2D, we're going through a 2D plane of parameterizations. And on the left, we're taking that parameterization on the right, and then I like, plot those kind of curves you see many times already using using the scaling given on the, given on the right. Okay, so in particular here, x, x axis is the learning rate, y axis is the training loss, and what you can observe is that only when the green dot here is on uh, on mu p is it the case that the like auto learning rate is stable with the uh, with the model, and you you know always get better performance as you scale up, uh, and uh, uh, for all the other you know points on the right side, uh, like you know you can either uh, see that the auto learning rate is shifting or like the curves are crossing, right? So, which means that at some point for some hyperparameters, increasing width actually does work. Okay, does it make sense? Any questions about this? Yeah, there's a quick question. So just did I get this, this right? So um, this is just in a, what exactly are those, uh, those 2D plane? Is that just uh, the, um, yeah. this is a one, one single neuron uh, network or? No, no, no. This is a this is an MLP, uh, like a three layer MLP on C or something. But uh, so so like the so for example, like I don't know, like mu p, like for example, the output layer learning rate. Remember, was scaling like one over fan in, mm. and then like the PyTorch D four is like constant with respect to width, and like so so like the learning rate is like the uh, scaling interpolation is like the the exponent here that I interpolates see. between zero and, and negative one here. And similarly for initialization, any, any difference in initialization, we're interpolating that exponent of the width between the PyTorch and default and MUP. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah. And what, is, what is tuned here and on what? I mean, there are all these constants, yeah. right? So do, do you tune them always on the on the blue one, on the smallest width? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Like, so we always tune the blue one. So you can see that the blue ones, the blue curve is pretty much the same between uh, all of that and, and that's by design. And uh, and then we scale up the model from there. Okay. And that's uh, <clears throat> is that fair for pipe torch default as well? Well, yeah. Well, I, mean, I tune everything on the small model, so like it's completely fair. Like they're identical, right? Uh, on on the smallest model. So you just when you scale up, they're different. Yeah. True. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Okay, uh, great. So, yeah, so um, now let me talk about uh, a quote unquote proof of the almost scaling thesis for width to give you some uh, idea of like the, the theoretical reasoning behind all this and, and uh, how we kind of uh, came up with the idea that hyperparent transfer is actually possible in the first place. So the proof is, uh, has two parts. The first part is actually purely mathematical uh, and it, it uh, classifies all the possible infinite width limits. Uh, and then the second part is a physical argument uh, by which I mean you need to use some intuition of what works and doesn't work in machine learning uh, in order to kind of eliminate all the possible uh, infinite width limits 
uh, until you only have MIPI left that can possibly give you the alpha parameterization. Okay. So uh, let's start with the pure mathematical argument. So the pure mathematical argument is this, uh, this theorem called dynamical dichotomy theorem, uh, which essentially like uh, tells you like what exactly are in this space of parameterizations, uh, which essentially is like high dimensional analog of the 2D plane that we saw earlier, where like each axis of this high dimensional space is kind of like the exponent of like scaling of learning rate or uh, initialization with the width model. And uh, it's a high dimensional space, but of course we can only represent two dimensions. So this is a character of what happens in the high dimensional space. And the basic uh, conclusion is that like most of the uh, limits and parameterizations are just bad. Like they're unstable or trivial, which means training blows up or gets stuck in initialization. But then there's an island in the middle of this garbage that uh, just uh, uh, is actually more interesting and, and you know, is stable and non-trivial. And most of the points on this island uh, is in the kernel regime, which means that like in the infinite width limit, the function, uh, the new network function uh, evolves in the function space by some like kind of linear style equation where like the change in the function every time step is proportional to some kernel times the loss derivative uh, at the function. So, you know, like this particular equation should be familiar if you ever looked at your tangent kernel uh, limit before. And uh, indeed, uh, NTK is like a particular point uh, on, this, uh, on this island. And um, likewise, for standard parameterization, if you use constant learning, it will blow up, like we saw in the uh, two layer MLP example before. But if you use one over width, uh, learning rate is, is the unique learning rate scaling that uh, doesn't make it unstable or trivial. And, uh, but unfortunately, like the, the, this uh, SP limit is still in the kernel regime, uh, which in particular means that like, there's no feature learning. So any, any limit in the kernel regime has no feature learning, by which mean, I mean like the, you know, the, if you look at the, the grand matrix, of the last layer embedding of uh, all the inputs in your data set or input space, then this grand matrix will not evolve in this infinite width limit as you train, right? So, so there's no change in the representation essentially. Okay, so if you look very closely, there's a, this like border here, upper border of this island, um, the brown strip that actually uh, involve all the uh, limits that actually perform feature learning. And in particular, this is distinguished point, uh, which uh, represents mu p uh, here. And um, uh, the, 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 the feature here, or sorry, the, uh, the characteristics of this uh, brown strip is that uh, everything essentially just looks like mu p, uh, except for if you're not mu p, you're just like a weaker version of mu p. So uh, as an example, like at uh, one point uh, on this uh, brown strip could be you just take mu p, but you just like scale the initial, sorry, the input layer weights learning rate uh, like, uh, a, uh, like a factor width smaller. So you just get, you just are you just scaling down the learning rate of the input layer is smaller. Uh, and as a result in the infinite width limit, like your essentially your learning rate in the input layer just goes to zero effectively. And so the input layer doesn't do any feature learning, but like all the uh, later layers do feature learning. So it still maintains this feature learning property, but it's not maximal, right? Because it, the, the input layer doesn't do feature learning. So uh, it turns out that like all of the brown points on the strip other than the black point is just some weaker version of MEP like this. Like some part of the network just gets stuck in initialization or it's not it's in, initialized and like, quite uh, smaller than the initialization of MUP. Um, yeah, so, so that's essentially like the, uh, the structure of the space here. Okay, so again, this is the pure mathematical argument where everything can be proved rigorously here. Um, and the second part is like taking this uh, classification of limits and see like what actually is possible to give you uh, this optimal parameterization. Right. Um, so, you know, we can start with the simple ones. So like 
we can look at the unstable or trivial uh, parameterizations. And uh, for obvious reasons, like this can't uh, be the optimal because for example, the optimal learning rate will convert to zero diverge. So, so you cannot have hyperparameter transfer here. Uh, secondly, the uh, uh, you can look at the, the current regime uh, parameterizations. And again, there are lots of ways to reject this. For example, it just doesn't do feature learning, but like concretely, you know, we, we actually know from concrete measurements uh, on real data sets that like the kernel limits are just worse than finite new networks performance wise. So uh, like on CIFAR 10 and Omniplot, uh, you can see there's like a significant gap between kernel solutions and finite new networks. So, so kernel limits like, you know, uh, cannot satisfy this larger is better property. And then uh, finally, um, we can look at the feature learning limits. And again, like I said, like the structure here is quite simple. Like all the brown points are essentially a weaker version of MUP. For example, by lowering the learning rate, some uh, layers by factor width or something like that. So that in the infinite width limit, like that learning rate is effectively goes to zero. So you essentially cannot satisfy the hyperparameter transfer for those particular learning rates, right? Like per layer learning rates that are guessing to zero in the infinite width limit. So at this point, the only thing left is mu p that can possibly give us these properties. And you know, as you maybe intuit from the, the MLP example before, like we should we have very good reasons to actually expect that these uh, properties should be satisfied. And then it just remains to actually test these out. Right. And as you saw in the animation before, that's exactly what happens. Uh, so in our research, it really was uh, like the way that we came up with this really was we did the theory and then we understood the implication of the theory and then we tested it and, and that gave us what we want. You know, instead of, you know, which is like the, the, the kind of the opposite way of how the research is done in deep learning typically. There's like some post hoc, you know, theoretical justification of some empirical finding. Uh, okay, maybe let me skip this in interest of time. Um, all right, so, uh, okay, let me actually also skip this. So uh, I'll, I'll finish by making an analogy with physics. So um, physics in physics, there's uh, an understanding that there are four fundamental forces of nature, so gravity, electromagnetism, uh, weak nuclear, strong nuclear. Uh, and uh, we have two very successful theories uh, developed over the course of the 20th century. Uh, one is the standard model, which describes like these uh, forces uh, on small objects, and then the relativity, which describes gravity on large objects. Of course, like, there's a very famous gap between these two models where like, uh, you know, in, in regimes where they both apply, they are actually contradictory. And that, that you know, uh, prevents us from get, getting to the elusive theory, everything that describes everything all at once. And in deep learning, we also have fundamental forces like width, depth, you know, training time and so on and so forth. These are those kind of same dimensions of uh, large neural networks. And, um, in a, in a sense, like tensor programs, like the theory underlying everything I've said so far, gives you a very pretty satisfactory um, uh, theory for describing large width neural networks. Um, but uh, in contrast to width, like all of these other dimensions are much less understood. And uh, for example, it's not even clear that they're fundamental scaling dimensions. Like you know, like plausibly, training time and batch size are very much tied together. Um, and like, like probably there's like some underlying notion that works for both of them. So I'm putting forward the search for the theory, everything for large scale deep learning that, you know, tries to encapsulate all these dimensions simultaneously that tells you, you know, how do you scale your hyperparameters when you change your uh, model dimension in any of these scaling dimensions. Um, and like, for example, like, you know, in our work here, we, Empirically, did uh, investigate you know scaling across depth, training time, and other stuff. But like, what is the actual right answer to to that question? Like, how do you scale those optimally? 
at the current point, we don't know. Um, and furthermore, we also want to know, like, question like, you know, if I just increase my flops, right, in, in training, like, how should I allocate my, uh, you know, uh, compute across with that training time, batch size, and so on and so forth, right? So that's a, also a very important question that needs to be answered today. And in this context, I see upon scaling thesis as a blueprint for uh, trying to arrive at this theory of everything. So the roadmap will look something like, you know, just take infinite size limits, classify all possible limits, and find the optimal limit uh, on the right side. And then you just transfer that to the left using this optimal scaling thesis, and hopefully you profit from that. But you can notice that, like, you know, taking limits and classifying objects are things mathematics is actually really, really good at. And you know, there are many fields metal one on just taking limits and classifying objects. Um, so it's a very much unique strength of mathematics. And you know, in general, you know, like uh, in, in a larger picture, uh, there's like a rough divide between scalable methods like neural networks, linear algebra, you know, so on and so forth, and unscalable methods. Like you know, brittle methods rely on human knowledge. You know, for example, special structure of chess or knowledge of words and phonemes and so on. So you know, famously, uh, Rick Sutton uh, had this blog post called "The Bitter Lesson," which posits that like in the long run, because Moore's law and because just compute gets uh, more abundant as time goes on, the scalable methods always win out uh, in the end. And in some sense. Like the scalable methods are exactly the ones that have infinite compute limits, right? Um, and uh, in that context, the optimal scaling thesis is just saying, you know, that like the right scalable methods are uh, are revealed by like the the optimal infinite compute limits of these methods. So if we can understand the theoretical infinite compute limits of these scalable methods, then we can also derive the optimal uh, empirical methods to use in practice. So as such, like, even though I framed it, you know, uh, this optimal scaling thesis in, in the context of scale, hyperparameter transfer and, you know, how do you scale, you know, depth and other stuff, that the, this, this question in is for generality is really a question at the center of AI research because, you know, if you believe in a better lesson, like Moore's law would just wash out everything that's not scalable and uh, doesn't have an infinite compute limit, right? So, so in the end, we're all, all just searching for what's the right infinite compute limit. Okay, so I, I'll stop here. Uh, here's the paper uh, again, and uh, you can actually use MEP today if you use PyTorch by doing pip install MEP, or you can look at the GitHub. Thanks.